Hey there, guys. Uh, welcome back to the video for uh, AP Psych. And we are going to be talking today in this video about statistical reasoning. Uh, this is basically the math that you're going to need to be able to know how to do for our AP Psych class. Um, this is uh, this follows the experimentation information that we talked about um, in previous videos. And uh, it is basically what do we do with the data and how do we organize it and how do we understand it? So um, you should watch all those other videos first and then that should get us into uh, this part of the lecture notes. So let's first by talking about data and um, what we do with it, right? So there are a few ways that we can talk about data, whether that's describing it or analyzing it. Um, just describing data looks, uh, can look at like something like a frequency distribution, right? So this is something that a, a colleague of mine at another school does. Um, his uh, exams are out of 40, or his tests are out of 40 questions. And he provides this breakdown of the frequency distribution for the students' grades in his class. Um, as you can see, right, it just shows you how often a score came up in uh, their, you know, in that class for that assessment. Uh, we also are going to look at bar graphs. Uh, which you should know what a bar graph is. You should also know that they are sometimes called histograms, um, which is important because sometimes questions might talk about a histogram or, or and you need to know that that's just a bar graph. Um, in the past, there have been bar graphs that students have needed to draw during the uh, FRQ part of the ex AP exam. So bar graphs are important that, uh, you know, you need to have a basic understanding of them. Uh, we're not going to be doing too much bar graphs in this class because I, I'm kind of assuming that you already know what they are and what they look like. Uh, another type of graph is a line graph, um, I guess a technical term, which I've never heard outside of uh, some of the psych notes that I've looked at, is a frequency polygon, which looks kind of like this. Uh, so this is like a, a weight chart, um, and it, it kind of shows you right a line graph. Right? Again, this is just describing data. It's not doing anything with the data uh, calculations or anything. It's just looking at it. So let's talk about um, statistical reasoning in general. So first off, um, it's important that we organize our data in meaningful ways. Um, a lot of things can get lost in data and in data translation. So it's important that we have a consistent and a clear uh, organization of our data when we're doing experimentation. The other thing we should always be wary of are big round numbers. Um, you should not ever expect like the average in this class on a test to be like an 83. Um, that is way too big of a round number, right? Uh, it's probably an 83.21 or something like that. Um, so when you're looking at data, when you're reading data, or, or scientific studies or anything, anytime that you see like a round number, right? A very easy round number, you should probably be skeptical of that. That is, uh, you know, something that might not be accurate, right? Maybe there's some rounding going on. So that's just a general kind of rule of thumb, be skeptical of uh, round numbers. The other thing that we, uh, you'll need to know are the measures of central tendency. Um, this is uh, mean, median, and mode. Hopefully you know what these are from your math classes. Um, in class, um, at one point in class, we will be watching, uh, I have a very catchy song for you uh, that, that goes over the mean, median, and mode. Um, so we will watch that. Uh, mean is the average. Median is the uh, number that is in the middle of a data set, uh, assuming it's an odd number of values. And mode is the number that shows up multiple or the most times. Um, you need to know how to calculate these three things. Uh, so you can be get on a test, you can be given a set of numbers and be told to find the mean, which means that you're going to have to do some calculations. And no, you are not allowed to use a, a calculator um, on, on the tests. Uh, now, these things are great. Measures of central tendency are wonderful, but it kind of doesn't do the best job in terms of organizing it if we have lopsided data. So sometimes you'll hear things like in the news, like, oh, 62% is below, income for 62% is below average. Well, what does that mean? How can 
the income of 62% of people be below the average, right? That must mean that there is an outlier, right? That must mean that there is a large outlier that is skewing the data one direction or the other. Um, and let's take a look at what that actually looks like. So here is a list of values of uh, baseball cards from 1968. You can see that Nolan Ryan's rookie card in 1968 is pretty valuable, much more valuable than the other players on this list. Um, so if you include Ryan in the uh, measures of central tendency, you're looking at a, a median of $2.50, right? Remember, median is the one in the middle. But the average, the average, because Nolan Ryan's is worth so much, is a whopping $74, okay? Now, it wouldn't be right to say that, oh, out of the top 20 uh, baseball cards from 1968, uh, they have an average value of $74. Like, that is technically true, right? Um, but it's not accurate, right? That would be, a, a, that would be misleading uh, what the actual results are, right? Because we have such a high outlier in terms of Nolan Ryan's baseball card. So if you do the same calculations without Ryan, right, the median is about the same, right, $2.38. Uh, notice that that is uh, the average between $2.50 and $2.25. Uh, and then the mean is $2.85. Again, that is removing Nolan Ryan. And that feels better, right? That feels closer to what it actually should be. Um, a lot of times, if averages are given, uh, a median should be given as well. Um, medians sometimes tell us a lot more information than averages do. Uh, that comes up a lot in uh, like salary information. So when people talk about like the top 1% or whatever, or the top 10% of earners or something like that, that number is skewed um, because of the, the high earning capacity of, of the upper, you know, 0.1% or 0.001%. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos, what, uh, you know, is worth over a hundred billion dollars, maybe even close to a trillion dollars at some point. Um, that is skewing the data very much so in one direction. Whereas, you know, a person making $50,000 a year, that's just looking at the average salaries that that's not, that's not valuable. As far as looking at the median salaries might be more valuable depending on what you're looking at. So it's important to know which measure of central tendency is most important for the data that you are trying to describe. Let's talk about something else, uh, and that is variation. Okay, uh, variation talks about how different the different um, different the the values are, right? The variation between them. So let's take a look at a. At a, a a bell curve, right? Or, or yeah, a bell curve, a normal curve, a normal distribution. So here you've got, uh, oops, let me move my picture. I'll go up here for now. That's cool. Look at that. Um, so now you've got, right, this normal, normal distribution. Looks like a bell curve. It's a standardized thing that we'll talk about more um, later in the year, a little bit soon, but a little bit later in the year. Now you'll notice that there are two sets of scores here. There's, right, the red score and the blue score. But notice that the averages are the same, right? The mean is the same, right? As far as the height is concerned, right? So the mean is the same number. But I don't think that either of us would say that these results are the same, right? There is a difference in the range that is associated with the mean, right? How far apart are the results? So a range is going to... Uh, basically be the highest number minus the lowest number in the data set, right? That gives you the range and that helps you understand, right, maybe which type of uh, bell curve we're looking at. And that also gets us to standard deviation. Standard deviation is similar to the correlation coefficients, is similar to uh, p-values in that you need to know what this is, but you do not need to know how to do it. OK, you don't need to calculate standard deviation, but you need to understand what it is. And to, to help do that, let's take a look at an example. OK, so let's say that um, we are we have a football team. Let's just assume that Holy Ghost Prep has a football team. And uh, let's just for the sake of argument, 
uh, you are uh, a helper with the special teams program. And we need to figure out together um, who our punter is going to be for the season. OK, we have a couple guys trying out, so we put them to the test. So we say, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to do some math and we're going to just take the best punter. OK, so let's say that uh, this punter uh, does four punts and gets these results. Right. Um, these are the numbers of the distance of the punt. So if we take the mean, the average, right, add them all up, you get 160. 160 divided by four means that the average is 40 yards. OK, now that's pretty good. Right. And it's also pretty consistent. If you look at those results, you'd say, you know what, Mr. Veerlink, if we said that this guy had an average of 40 yards, uh, yeah, I'd be pretty comfortable with that. Right. That is a pretty av that is pretty spot on uh, accurate depiction of what uh, this guy we can expect from this guy. So now we could also say the same thing with a, a guy who's, uh, you know, punting it uh, 20 yards half the time and 60 yards half the time. Right. The average is still going to be 40 yards. But is that the punter we necessarily want? Right. Maybe it is. Right. I'm not making a judgment here. Maybe that is the punter we want, knowing that sometimes we're going to be, you know, our defense is going to have to step up and and defend poor field position because this punter shanked it. Um, also knowing that maybe they can, you know, pin them back by, by bombing at 60 yards. But I would argue that we probably want a more consistent punter, someone that we can be more, that is more reliable. So how do we figure that out? And we do that by standard deviation. So if you look at uh, the next step, which is deviation from the mean. So how far away are each item from the mean, from the average that we calculated? So 36 is minus four away, 32 is minus two, plus one, plus five, okay? Now, what we need to do, because we're trying to figure out like the distance from the mean and how, how closely all of these things are related, we need to square the deviation because that way we, we are dealing with positive numbers. So we got 16, uh, four, one, and then 25, okay? That gives us a number of 46, okay? And if we take the average of that, right? So the average deviation from the mean, squared is 11.5. That is called the variance. Okay. That is the variance. That is how much each uh, item varies from the mean squared. Standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Okay. Since we squared it to get positive numbers here, we need to then take the square root to make sure that we're still, we're staying within the same, uh, I don't know what that's called. Family size. Mrs. Carmine would kill me. Uh, but that's 3.4 yards. OK, so what is this saying? And this is really what we need to understand here. Standard deviation shows us how close the numbers are to the average. OK, uh, going back to the Nolan Ryan baseball card example, including Nolan Ryan in there, the average was a 74, right? If we took the standard deviation, it would have a very high standard deviation because most of the cards are nowhere near that $74 value, right? So the variance, the difference from the, the average would be much higher, which would result in a higher standard deviation. When you have a high standard deviation, that means you're talking about a larger range of data, okay? So... Um, if we use the same example with that guy that's that's bombing at 60 yards and shanking it for 20 yards, right? That standard deviation, while the average would still be 40, right? Remember that the average is still the same. The standard deviation instead of 3.4 yards might be something like eight or nine yards, right? Maybe even more than that. That is a very high standard deviation. And high standard deviations means that we're going to expect numbers to be pretty far from that average. We're going to be dealing with extremes. The smaller the standard deviation, the closer all of those scores are to the average. So in this class, um, once everyone's taken the test, in class the next day, I will be sharing the, the means and the standard deviations of our test scores, every test that we take. And what that's going to show is not only what the average is, but then how close everybody was to the average. So if we have an average of 70, let's just say, and a standard deviation of 15, well, that means that a lot of guys were doing really well and really poorly, 
right? 15 is a very, very, very high standard deviation for a test score. Um, if the average is 70 and the standard deviation is like a two, that means that almost everybody probably got within a 65 and a 75, right? And what is that telling us? That's telling us that the mean is a more accurate representation of what the data is meant to show, okay? That doesn't always happen. Again, think back to the Nolan Ryan example. The, the average can be skewed by outliers. And how do we account for that? We account for that by using standard deviation. You do not need to know how to calculate this. You will never be asked to, to here's a set of data, find the standard deviation. You will never need to know how to do that. What you need to know is what does it mean, okay? The larger standard deviation, the farther away from the data, from the average that the data is. The, clo the smaller the standard deviation, the closer to the average they are. And let's talk about the normal curve for just a second. I told you we'd come back to it and we'll be spending more time with this later, especially when we get into intelligence. But a normal curve is, is a thing in math and in science and in data representation. Um, it is not, uh, you know, oh, this is a normal curve. It, you know, it's, it's not abnormal. No, no, a normal curve has specific values associated with it. And they are uh, as shown in, on, this, on this normal curve. Uh, basically, what that means is you have equal number of scores uh, on either side of the mean, right? So in this case, the mean intelligence is 100. Um, and with a normal curve, there are 68% of respondents of data of whatever you're studying will fall within one standard deviation of the mean, okay? So 68% of all scores and all intelligence scores are going to fall within one standard deviation, right? So 34% above it and 34% below it. Two standard deviations is 96%. Right, so 96% of all data that is represented in a normal curve falls within two standard deviations of the mean, right? So in this case, it would be 70 to 130, okay? Uh, I believe it's actually not 2%, but uh, within three standard deviations of the mean, I believe it's 99.7% of all data shows up within three standard deviations of the mean on a normal curve. Not all data is gonna be represented on a no normal curve. Some data are. What you need to know are these percentages and how they relate to a normal curve. Okay, so you're just gonna to need to memorize that. And I also have a fun video and song for that as well. Okay, um, so look forward to that. Uh, the last thing that we are going to uh, just basically talk about quickly are inferences. Um, Inferences have to do with things like, are the samples representative of the larger group? Are we having issues um, with multiple uh, interpretations of the same data? Um, we know that more cases are better than fewer, right? So when we're talking about data, right, the more, you know, if I've got 10 people that I'm studying versus 100 people, 100 people is probably a better uh, way for me to make inference about behavior. Remember that statistical significance means the odds of something occurring by chance. And in social science, the, the value that we need to get is less than 5% likelihood of it falling by chance. And that can happen um, even though we might have large differences, right? We could have um, data that shows a major difference in you know, results, but that might not be statistically significant, right? That is a separate calculation that has to be done. Right? Sometimes we see that with homogenous samples, right? So all of the groups happen to be, you know, maybe by accident, all of the, uh, all of the top kids end up being all the, if we're doing that cookie analogy or experiment we were doing before, maybe all of the smart kids happen to all get cookies, right? That could happen and we would have a homogenous sample and that would make our data um, more difficult to understand or, or maybe not be uh, fully appropriate or even statistically significant. So again, I, I say this multiple times because I can't tell you how many times students will say that statistical significance talks about importance. That's not true. Statistical significance only deals with uh, the likelihood that the results were caused by the independent variable manipulation. It is not caused by chance or has less than a 5% chance, 5% probability of being caused by chance. 
All right, so that's going to be it for the research methods unit. Uh, there's a lot here, guys, so make sure that you're studying and reviewing as much as you can. Um, and I will catch you next time when we talk about our next unit. All right, take care.